wanted to uh, welcome our guest this afternoon, Alberto Cairo. He is an expert in data visualization, and his talk today is going to explain how to decode misleading charts, infographics, and data maps. This talk has been spearheaded and initiated by the great uh, Brown Political Review here uh, that is uh, seated here at Watson. Um, so thank you very much to BPR for all the work that they have done, and also the Taubman Institute for uh, American Institutions. Um, Alberto Cairo's uh, background is the following. He is a professor of pro professional practice at the University of Miami and a Knight Chair in Visual Journalism at the Knight Foundation. Foundation. He also holds a bachelor's in journalism from the University of Santiago de Compostela and a research-oriented master's degree on information society studies from the Universitat Oberto de Catalunya, and that is in Barcelona. Um, he teaches on a range of courses uh, on information graphics, uh, visualization, and is quite interested in the convergence between visual communication, journalism, cognitive science, cartography, and statistics. So please let's welcome Erbacho Cairo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's that, that kind of introduction sounds too impressive. I consider myself just a journalist. I am a journalist who happens to do graphics to inform the public. Sorry, do you hear me well now? Okay, perfect. I will try to speak closer to the microphone. Um, so I consider myself a journalist first. I began my career as a journalist. I still practice journalism and I teach journalism as well at the University of Miami. I'm both a practitioner and also sort of a scholar uh, in, in visual communication. And uh, in order to, to begin the talk today and to introduce you to the topics that I would like to present, um, I, I would like to explain where, where this talk came from, how this talk uh, came about and the reasons why I, the reason why I'm doing it uh, in several cities uh, all over the United States and also in Europe uh, recently uh, it all began with a concern of mine and in order to uh, before I get to that concern I need to explain a little bit about where I come from and what I did before uh, becoming a, becoming a professor at the University of Miami so as I said before I, I am a journalist by training and also by practice I began my career back in 1997 in Spain. I'm originally from Spain, uh, from Galicia in the northwestern part of Spain. And then um, around 1999 or something like that, I moved to Madrid and I started working for a news publication called El Mundo, where I did these kinds of visual presentations. Uh, we call those kinds of things, I'm going to take my jacket off. Um, those kinds of things, we call them in the news media infographics or information graphics, right? Those are mainly pictorial representations of information to explain to the public how something happened, how something works, you know, the latest NASA space mission or something, how the machinery of that thing works, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and later on in my career, I started getting more interested in another kind of uh, visual representation of information that we call nowadays data visualization, which is the visual representation of quantitative uh, data. Now, no, nowadays we see these kinds of presentations everywhere in the media, right? We see them in newspapers, in magazines, in social media, on textbooks, and so on and so forth. And I believe that that is absolutely, that's absolutely wonderful. They are literally everywhere, and they are becoming a mainstream language used by many communities, by many fields fields by many knowledge communities as well. Um, I have also written a couple of books about the field. The first one is the functional art, which focuses a little bit more on pictorial representations of information. And the second one, the truthful art, which focuses a little bit more on data visualization, right? how to represent data mainly through graphs, all right? but also through, uh, through data maps. And in, that, in those books, I define visualization in a very broad manner as any sort of representation that is intended to let you, to allow you to explore information and discover things out of the data by representing the data graphically, or to communicate those data. Once you find your results, once you find, so to speak, the story that you need to tell, how you tell that story, how you communicate that story uh, through some sort of narrative format or something like that, right? Now, 
Um, I will get to the uh, to reason of the talk in just one minute, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that I teach at the University of Miami. So besides doing graphics, I also teach how to do graphics. I teach concepts in data visualization, such as the principle of visual encoding, right? So data visualization is mostly about visual encoding. Visual encoding means that in data visualization, you begin with a bunch of numbers, right? 25, 30, whatever. And then what you do is to proportionally represent those numbers through the variation of, a, of properties of certain objects, right? So for instance, you could vary the length or the height of a particular object, like in a bar graph, right? A bar graph, the size of the bar is proportional to the numbers that the bars are representing. You can also use position to represent your data, right? In that case, the method of encoding of the data will be the position of those dots or other kinds of symbols along common axes. You can use size, right? Like in bubble charts and in bubble maps, the size of the of the bubble will be proportional to the number of the uh, of that are represented. You can use angle, like in pie charts, or line weight, like in other kinds of graphics. You can use color. You can use shades of color. The key here is always to represent the numbers uh, through some sort of proportional connection between the magnitudes that you're representing and then the that a spatial property that you choose to encode your data. This is the core idea behind data visualization. And visualization, as I mentioned before, I believe is becoming a common language, is becoming a mainstream language. We see them everywhere, right? One of the reasons why that is happening is that news media, for example, is publishing more and more and more data visualizations every single day. If you read the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, 538, Vox.com, the Boston Globe, which I, I saw the pe these people yesterday, said all these organizations are using data visualization on a regular basis to communicate complex stories to readers. And I believe that that is absolutely wonderful. Huh? And they are helping popularize the language of data visualization among the general public. This is great, right? There is also another reason why visualization is becoming a popular nowadays and a mainstream language, a mainstream way of conveying information to people, which is the role of some kind of people that I would call popularizers of data visualization. The most famous one, his name is Hans Rosling, was Hans Rosling. Professor Hans Rosling sadly passed a few months ago. Um, in case that you're not familiar with him, I would recommend that you, that you Google him up at some point. He was a professor of global health in Sweden at uh, the Karolinska Institute, and he became very famous back in 2006 after he gave, he delivered a lecture at the TED conferences in which he presented very complex public health data in a very engaging manner through words, spoken words, but also through visuals, so through data visualizations. He became so famous that later on he did a documentary for the BBC called The Joy of Stats, in which he explained that statistics can be a lot of fun. It depends on how you present them and how you explain them. And this is just some images, some footage from that, uh, from that documentary in which he shows a scatter plot with income on the x-axis and then um, a life expectancy on the y-axis and then the countries will start appearing over there, the position of the countries in 1810 countries will start appearing over there, right? <coughs> Hans Rosling became really, really famous, and he also helped popularize data visualization. All right, so here comes my concern and the reason for this talk to exist, and the reason why I'm going to explain a few principles that I believe that are critical to understanding data visualization well. I belong to several communities, right, that try to push visualization forward, right? I'm going to talk about these communities a little bit. I belong to the community of what we could call data journalists, right? People who use data in journalism on a regular basis and present those data to the public, right? I, I am part of that community. Here you have several screenshots of graphics that were designed by friends of mine who work at all those places that I mentioned before. Uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, ProPublica, which is another wonderful a media organization that does investigative reporting, usually based on data, in collaboration with statisticians and scientists, etc. All these people who work in this community that I belong to, they are trying to push visualization forward, trying to create new ways of representing data that are engaging and colorful and fun, but also informative, right? And experimenting all the times with all the time with new maps, new kinds of graphs, new kinds of charts, and so on and so forth, right? So 
try to visualize a spectrum. I like to draw infographics with my own hands. Visualize a spectrum in which you have over here very little knowledge about visualization and over here a lot of knowledge about visualization or very little progress in visualization and a lot of progress in visualization. The communities that I belong to are over here and we are trying to push them even forward, even in further to the right, right? More ways of representing data, innovative ways of representing data and so on and so forth, right? There is actually another community that I belong to that is also trying to create new methods of representing information, communities of scholars, right? I work at the University of Miami. I teach at the uh, School of Communication at the University of Miami. I am part of a center at the University of Miami called the Center for Computational Science, all right, which has a, vis has a visualization division. We have a visualization lab in which you can see, th you can see data in 3D. You can put some glasses on and explore the data. Just a few minutes ago, I visited the Yard Center here, the Center for Computation and Visualization, right next door here at Brown University, and they demonstrated to me the, uh, the capabilities of that center in which you can basically immerse yourself in the data and explore it in 3D in a virtual reality experience. That's absolutely wonderful, right? We are creating all these new technologies, all these new ways of representing data. We are pushing visualization forward. We are improving the language of visualization and pushing forward, right? I am also in collaboration with companies such as Google. I have a, an ongoing collaboration with a division in Google called the Google News Lab, uh, in which we are collaborating with designers from all over the world to create uh, artistic ways of representing data and innovative ways of representing data, so on and so forth. I have friends who create new ways of representing data. For example, there is a, a, a writer who writes regularly about visualization called Stephen Few, who has several books about visualization. For example, Show Me the Numbers. And Steve likes to come up with new ways of representing data. For example, six or seven years ago, he created a new variation of the bar graph that he called the bullet graph. That's the bullet graph in which you can condense a lot of data in a very small space. I'm not going to explain to you how to read that graph, right? So all these communities, all these communities are pushing visualization towards this end of the spectrum. But here comes my concern, right? We are over here and moving forward to, towards this end of the spectrum. My concern is whether by moving so far towards the end of the spectrum and so fast, creating new ways of representing data, all those new wonderful technologies, etc. My concern is whether we are not leaving part of the public behind, right? The general public, right? General citizens. Huh? And I'm going to explain to you why I believe that this may be the case, that at least part of the public is falling a little bit behind in terms of how they are able or unable to read data visualization correctly. Back in 2014, the Pew Research Center, uh, based in Washington, D.C., conducted a survey in which they asked a sample of 1,000 and something people, what do you see in this chart, right? So this graph over here is a scatter plot, right? So on the x-axis, each one of the dots represents a country, right? And then the position of each one of those dots along the x-axis represents the average sugar consumption grams per person per day. So the further to the right a dot is, the more sugar each the people in this country on average consume every day. And then the position on the y-axis of all these dots represents the average number of decay teeth of people in that country. So you can, once you understand how to read the scatter plot, you can immediately see that there is some sort of relationship between the number of grams of sugar that you consume and the number of decay teeth that people in those countries have on average. Right? Very simple, easy to understand. Now, only 63% only of the sample consulted by the Pew Research Center got the right message from this chart. The other 37% were confused or didn't understand this chart correctly, or they, I don't know, they just answered wrong to the question, what do you see in this graph, which is so basic and so simple. Now, simple for some kinds of people, but not for everybody, right? The thing is that this is worrying for several reasons. 
one of the reasons why I believe that this is worrying is that the scatter plot is not a novel way of representing data. It's not one of it's not a the bullet graph. It's not three D or virtual reality. It's not one of those crazy artistic ways that friends of mine are developing out there to represent data. The scatter plot has been around for more than one hundred and fifty years. The scatter the first scatter plots appeared in history thanks to the work of people like Sir Francis Galton back in the 19th century. Galton was a statistician and a social researcher who did studies, for example, comparing the uh, height of a person and the size of the head of, of a sample of people, right? Discovering that there is a linear relationship between the height of a person and the size of the head of a person, right? So the, the taller you are, the bigger your head. Always remembering, and this is a point that probably Galton made uh, at some point during his studies, that there are always exceptions to that rule, right? For example, I'm, I, I'm quite short and stocky, but I have a very big head. So I'm a little bit of an outlier in this mix, right? Well, this is one of the first scatter plots that Galton made during his studies. He was, by the way, one of the first people people to talk about correlation and regression and things like that. So this graphic form that has been around for more than 150 years, there is still roughly one third of the population, at least in the United States, who sort of cannot read it correctly. That is worrying per se. That is worrying per se. But there is more. People who study visualization for a living, scholars who study visualization for a living, have sort of discovered that visualization is extremely persuasive. All right? I'm going to show you just a screenshots of a couple of, of, of papers that I have seen in the past few years. The first one, who was, which was written by a few friends of mine who worked in visualization in departments of computer science, is titled The Persuasive po Power of Data Visualization. And this is just a screenshot of, a, of another one. What these studies have discovered, basically, and again, they need to be replicated and so on and so forth. But temporarily, right, there is a worrying, a worrying message that these papers convey, which is that if you present the same message to two different groups of people in two different ways, one of them will be more persuasive than the other. And this is what I mean. If you present the message just in written format, like a long piece of writing, that message will be less persuasive than if you present exactly the same piece of writing, but you insert charts and graphs and maps and numbers. Once you put charts and graphs and numbers in the message, that message becomes more persuasive for most people. Now, these researchers conjecture that this may be, and again, this re will require more research, this might be because people tend to, we tend to equate numbers with objectivity, right? And we tend to equate numbers and graphics with science, right? Once you put a very complex graph in any sort of document, that document suddenly be, feels, sort of feels, and intuitively, it feels more scientific, right? And we tend to trust it a little bit more. This is problematic. It's highly problematic for a different reason, for, for several reasons. Among them, for example, some of these people have sort of discovered that it doesn't really matter that the chart that you put in your message has anything to do with the content of the writing. All right? As long as you put a chart in there, even if it is completely unrelated to the message, the message that you convey on the writing becomes more persuasive to you for some reason. This is very worrying. Because on one hand, we have a substantial portion of the population who sort of cannot read graphics that well. But on the other hand, you also have a portion of the population, we don't know if they are the same people, obviously, but we know that there is a, 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 a substantial portion of the population who are convinced and persuaded by the mere present, present, presence of graphics, and charts, and maps, and data, data graphics, etc., in the media. Right? We are convinced once we see them. I believe that this provokes a sort of, will provoke, I believe, sort of um, a perfect storm, right? the combination of these two factors. right? So for a while, I this, a, a year, a couple of years ago, I decided to come up with uh, some sort of talk, this talk over here, that will explain the general public, anybody, how to read charts and maps better, how to become better readers of charts and maps. And the original title of the talk was graphicacy, which is a term that I like to use quite a lot in my writings and teaching, right? This is the original title of the talk. Now, why did I call this talk originally graphicacy? Because I once read a book by cartographer Mark Momonier, a very famous cartographer with tons of different uh, and very wonderful books about data maps, in which Momonier said that today, in order to be an educated person, 
literacy is not enough, all right? Literacy, obviously, is the ability to read well and the ability to write well, to convey some sort of message. But Monmorner says that nowadays, that is not enough to be an educated person. He says in his book, Mapping It Out, that today, to consider yourself an educated person, you need to have literacy, right? You also need to, ha you need to have the ability to express yourself well using spoken words, right? That we could call that articulacy, right? Then you also need the ability to sort of reason about numbers. It doesn't, doesn't mean, obviously, that you need to become an expert in statistics, but at least you need to be able to reason at a basic level about numbers, about scientific evidence, and so on and so forth. And he calls that numeracy. All right? There's a wonderful book, by the way, called In Numeracy, which was published many years ago by a different author. And then he finally says that a fourth skill that, you, that we all need to develop is graphicacy, which is graphical literacy, the ability to read graphs and maps and charts correctly and extract meaning from those graphics and extract the right meaning from the graphics, obviously. I'd like to add, by the way, a fifth skill over there that I like to call computeracy. This is a word that is completely made up, obviously, which is the ability to understand the digital world, right? The ability to understand what a computer is, how a computer works, uh, what the internet is, how social media works in the background, and so on and so forth, right? But I'm not going to, going to get into that. Anyway, so this talk, or the, the way I put it together, is intended for you to use. So the reason why you were asked to sign up when you enter this room and add your email address to a list is because I am going to share all the slides that I'm presenting today with all of you, with the assumptions that if you are convinced of the ideas that I'm going to be presenting today, uh, with the intention that you will help me spread these ideas later on, improve upon those ideas, expand on those ideas. If you teach classes, you should feel free to use all these slides in your own classes. Uh, and also, in that link that will be sent to you through email, uh, this afternoon probably. Besides the slides that I'm showing you today, uh, I have also put together a series of articles and book chapters and book recommendations that expand on the content of this talk, okay? Which is, I th again, intended to explain general people how to become better readers of data visualization, how to become better readers of charts, data maps, graphs, and so on and so forth. And I hope that you will help me um, um, you will help me spread the word about, uh, convince people, convince the general public, friends, family, students, etc., or your, your colleagues if you're a student, to abandon certain cliches and certain uh, misconceptions that people in general tend to use whenever they talk about data visualization. I'm going to just show you a few of misconcep few misconceptions and cliches that I have, er, her, that I have heard and read about, read about throughout my career. For example, the ever-present, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is not true, as I will show you later on um, a, with several, several examples. Sometimes a picture may be worth a thousand words, but sometimes you need, you need 1,000 words to explain a picture, right? So it may work the other way around as well, right? Um, this, the reason why people believe this is that they tend to believe that a, that a visualization, a graphic, is sort of an illustration that can be understood um, intuitively, and charts cannot be understood intuitively, as, as I will show you in just one minute. There is another cliche that I have heard quite a lot throughout my career, in journalism in particular. This data or this chart speaks for itself, right? You see a chart, well, I see everything here. I, I understand everything, right? The chart speaks for itself. I don't need to know anything else. And moreover, as a, deri uh, as, as a derived um, a, a cliche out of these, uh, there's a certain kind of headline that news organizations are using quite a lot recently uh, that I have, I have became to, I have, I have uh, started hating with all my heart, um, which, uh, and probably you have seen it several times, this chart or series of charts show everything you need to know about, mm, or this series of maps, all right? I see this kind of headline all the time. These 11 maps or these 15 maps show you everything you want to know about the world economy. Well, no chart, no map, no series of maps, no series of charts ever show you everything you possibly want to know about a particular topic. And certainly, picture, or pictures are not always worth a thousand words. Sometimes, sometimes we need words in order to explain those pictures. As an introduction to why, as to why all those cliches are wrong, I'm going to show you a graphic that many people believe is quite intuitive, but everybody gets 
wrong, right? Everybody gets wrong. This kind of graphic. I'm from Miami. Well, I'm not from Miami, but I live in Miami, right? So I live in Miami. I see this kind of map every single year during hurricane season, right? This is by a, a recent map. This was one of the maps that were used by news media during Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Irma was approaching Florida, and news media started showing this kind of map every single day, right? As you can see, it's a map that shows you the probable path of the of the center of the hurricane. That's explicit in the in the caption. It says the caption says. Uh, the cone contains the probable path of the storm center, but does not show the size of the storm. So they sort of explain how to read the graphic, right? That cone, right, represents the possible paths of the hurricane, right? Now, everybody gets this map wrong, or nearly, nearly everybody gets this kind of map wrong, right? It, that's called the cone of uncertainty. In Miami, sometimes we call it the cone of death, because people tend to believe that if you're inside that cone, all right, you will be you will be threatened by the storm, which is sort of true, right? Now this map is highly problematic for several reasons, and in order to explain how people read and also misread this map, I created my own version of the map because this one is a little bit too clatter; it has too many elements, it's a little bit too busy. So I, I like good design and clear design with a better hierarchy. So I created a completely fictional hurricane map, her cone of uncertainty map, uh, based also on a completely fictional. Uh, a hurricane that is approaching the United States. And being a little bit narcissistic, I decided to call this hurricane uh, with my own name. So we have there Hurricane Cairo, a category five, obviously, because I'm narcissistic, I cannot be a category one, right? So I need to be a category five. Anyway, so we have Hurricane Cairo, category five, approaching the southern coast of the United States from Cuba, right? And then we have, there we have the cone, right? Now, how to read that cone, right? That cone basically represents the possible range of possible paths of the center of the hurricane. So when you see that cone, what scientists are trying to tell you is that you should not visualize a mass of color. You should visualize, so to speak, hundreds of possible lines, each one of them based on a, on a slightly different predictive model, right? a for, different forecast. Okay? Environmental scientists play a little bit with variations of wind speeds and, and air pressure, etc. And each one of those little variations yields a completely different forecast. Okay? And so the cone of uncertainty contains the probable paths of the hurricane, right? But this is not how many people read this map, right? There have been some experiments uh, showing average readers, right, users of this map, people who live in Miami and South Florida, and asking them, what do you see in this map? And even if they read the caption, uh, on the map, some people, not everybody, but some people, when they see the cone of uncertainty, they don't see the probable paths of the center of the hurricane, they see the hurricane itself. They see something like that, right? They visualize the size of the hurricane, not the possible paths of the eye of the storm, but the storm itself. Now, people are not stupid. This is something that we need, an idea that we also need to abandon, right? That people are just, you know, they're careless, or they don't care, or they are just illiterate, they don't know how to read these maps. There is a reason why many people believe that this is representing the size of the storm, because there is a pictorial resemblance, all right, between the shape of the hurricane cone, which is sort of rounded, and the shape of an actual hurricane. So your brain automatically makes the connection, intuitively, right, and unconsciously, right? But but obviously we know that this is not how to read the map, right? The map, again, represents the possible paths of the hurricane. Now, not probably none of you made this mistake, right? But uh, let me tell you a mistake that everybody makes, right? The first time that you see a cone of uncertainty, the first question is as to whether the cone of uncertainty contains all possible paths of the center of the hurricane, right? Now, knowing a little bit about numbers, I guess that most of you uh, are studying or have studied the statistics or are studying science, etc. you know that no model is ever perfect, right? So we can assume that the cone of uncertainty, as, as, as good as it can be, right, depending on the forecast models that scientists use, will, not, will, not, will never contain all possible paths, right? They were, there are always possible outliers here and there, right? So this was not my assumption. The first time that I saw a cone of uncertainty, I didn't assume that it contained all possible paths. My assumption, the first time that I saw a cone of uncertainty, is that it contained 95 out of 100 possible hurricanes, or possible paths of the center of the hurricane. My assumption was that when I saw the cone of uncertainty for the first time, is that scientists were telling me, 
If you had 100 hurricanes that are identical to this one that is coming to us, 95% of the time, the path of the center of the hurricane will lie within the boundaries of the cone of uncertainty. But there may be some strange cases in which the path could go anywhere outside, right? It could go over here or it could go over here. So five out of 100 times, the path of the center of the hurricane could go outside, right? This is the, this is the assumption that I would guess somebody who has some training on, on science, for example, will assume. Why? Because we remember stats 101 and we remember concepts such, such as the confidence interval, although this is not a confidence interval, obviously, but we remember the confidence interval at the 95% level and blah, blah, blah. We all have those models in mind and we apply them to this thing. And this is not true. This is not true. Based, something that is often not disclosed in cones of uncertainty maps is that based on past successes and failures at predicting the possible path of the center of the storm, the cone doesn't contain 95 out of 100 of those paths. It only contains 66%. That means that one out of three times, the path of the center of the hurricane could go anywhere on at either side of the cone of uncertainty. And only two out of three times, the cone will contain the possible path of the center of the hurricane. Not many people are aware of this. Nobody that I am familiar with or that I'm friends with reads this map correctly. And when they, when they read that, when they show that, they are completely shocked, right? Now, the, when we see a map like that then, what we should be visualizing instead then will be like some sort of a spaghetti map with tons of possible lines, with different probabilities of occurrence, right? With different shades of color, which could go anywhere. This is a range of possible paths of the center of the hurricane. Instead of seeing, by the way, six possible paths, imagine that there are like hundreds and hundreds of possible lines in between these ones, okay? So a possible range, range of paths over here. Um, the challenge is, obviously, that even if you do a spaghetti map like this, uh, the spaghetti map will only show, again, the center of the hurricane, right? And, and a hurricane is a huge thing. So if you want to inform the public as to whether what, what it is that they need to do, whether they need to leave or whether they need to protect their homes a little bit better, perhaps showing just the center of the hurricane is not enough. You need to show the span, right, the size, the, the radius of the hurricane. The challenge is that if you do that, if you overlay the size of the hurricane, of this imaginary hurricane, on top, of that line, you may get some pushback because people will tell you, well, this hurricane could go anywhere, right? Which is actually true. The hurricane could go anywhere, right? So sometimes I wonder whether presenting all these levels of uncertainty, all these levels of, you know, forecast, detail, etc., is productive or is even useful, or whether it is better when you want to convey a clear message to the public as to what they need to do in order to protect themselves and their families and property, whether it is not better to just tell them what to do very clearly, as clearly as possible. <laughs> right? Anyway, so people miss it. That's not very appropriate for a university environment, but anyway, forgive me. Um, I'm from Europe, so anyway, um, <laughs> we use bad words all the time. Uh, anyway, so uh, people misinterpret even, even graphics that look so intuitive and so clear to us that we, the, time, the first time that we see them, we misinterpret them constantly, right? And this is actually quite worrying. Therefore, I have tried to come up with a series of recommendations for general people, not for scientists, but for people who are not scientists, a series of recommendations that we could use to become better readers of visualizations when we see them in the media, when we see them in, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, when we see them anywhere, on TV, etc. It's, it's five recommendations, but there's one that comes before any of those five, which is it precedes everything else, which is that we need to convince friends, family, students, colleagues, etc., that visualizations are not meant to be seen. They are meant to be read. Therefore, in order, the first thing that we need to do to become better readers of visualization is to actually pay attention to the visualization, right? We need to read, for example, on a graph. We need to read the legend. We need to read the scales. We need to take a clear look, a, a, a closer look at how the data is represented. We can only do that if we pay attention to the graphic. And the reason why I, see, I say this is, is that I am on social media, I'm on Twitter, and I know how easy it is to see a beautiful graph Right? Oh, this looks so cool. And you retweet it without reading it carefully, right? Without assessing whether that graph looks fine or it looks dubious or it requires a little bit more of research in order to decide whether you need to tweet it or not and so on and so forth. So 
First of all, we need to pay attention. Now, once we pay attention to the graph, right, there are several, I, there are at least five things that we could consider whenever we see a visualization. The first one is to ask ourselves or to see whether the designer of that visualization is disclosing the origin of the data, what is the primary source of the data, whether the designer or the journalist who is reporting those data links directly to the primary source, all right? This is for the younger people in the room. If you see a news organization online that doesn't link directly to the primary source of the data, that's a huge red flag. Very, very huge red flag. So that is very important that journalists, and that, that we actually demand from journalists that they disclose their sources, where the information comes from, and that they link directly to the primary source. So as a reader, you can take a quick look at the primary source to assess whether the graphic looks fine or it doesn't look good, right? Now, if they do this, if they disclose the source, it's good practice to take a quick look at the primary source. This doesn't mean that you need to spend half an hour reading all the data, etc. but you can still take a quick look at where the data comes from, what the methodology was that under the data was generated. It only takes a few minutes, right? Now, in order to do this, in order to explain to people who are not scientists how to do this, uh, I came up with a few examples that, that I use in classes and in these kinds of lectures to illustrate this principle. Uh, the first one is based on a map that I saw on Twitter once and that I retweeted immediately because I absolutely loved it. All right? It's a map that shows the concentration of heavy metal bands in Europe. All right? So this is the number of heavy metal bands uh, per million people per country, right? So you have lower concentrations of heavy metal bands down here, higher concentrations of heavy metal bands up there, right? Actually, you can immediately see probably that the heavy metal capital of the world is Finland. Finland has the highest uh, concentration of heavy metal bands in the world. They also have the most hardcore heavy metal. Right? So they have like sub-branches of heavy metal that are called things such as doom metal and death metal. So they're super, super heavy, right? Now, I happen to be a fan of heavy metal and hard rock, so I love this map, right? And when we love a graphic so much, we feel prompted to immediately retweet it, right? So I saw it, I said, this is so cool, I retweeted it. But then I thought twice, I said, well, wait, wait a second. What is, it that, what is it that these people are counting? What is it that they are calling heavy metal? Are they counting the right thing? Are they counting the right kinds of bands, right? Now, in order to assess whether they are counting the right kinds of bands, heavy metal bands, it is quite useful to um, imagine first what would be sort of the average of the metal bands, the, the most representative heavy metal band, right? The heavy metal band that condenses or that has all the features that we commonly associate with heavy metal in terms of musical style, in terms of attitude, in terms of clothing, in terms of attitude towards life, and so on and so forth. The most representative heavy metal band. Now, if you are from the US, probably you have Metallica in band in mind, which is very representative heavy metal band, but I'm, I'm I'm from Europe, and I grew up during the 80s. And for me, the most representative heavy metal band, the most metal of the metal bands in all senses of the word, is Judas Priest. Now, Judas Priest has everything that is metal about heavy metal. So they have the leather jackets, the long hair, except the singer who is bald, but all the other guys have long hair, right? The, uh, the skinny jeans or the skinny leather, leather pants. Uh, the bikes, so whenever they have like a live show, they enter the stage on a huge bike, rawr, like that. The songs are pure heavy metal, so they have very goofy lyrics about demons and monsters and stuff, right? So it's all metal that is metal about metal, right? The most metal of the metal bands. So let's let imagine a distribution of bands, right? Judas Priest is at the center of that distribution. They have all the features that are associated with heavy metal. So the way to think about the source of these data, and the, 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 by the way, I forgot to mention that, the designer of the map before rightly disclosed the origin of the data. So he linked directly to a database that the, where the data come from. So the, he did the right thing. So we can take a look at the data. So anyway, Judas Priest is at the center, right? They have all the features. If all the bands that are reported in this data set are similar to Judas Priest, they share a lot of features with Judas Priest, not all of them perhaps, but lots, lots of features such as the leather jackets and the attitude and so on, we can basically decide that they are heavy metal. They are just counting heavy metal bands, right? But um, I got worried about this and I decided to verify the data because being familiar with the history of heavy metal, I have read quite a lot, I have read books even about the, the history of heavy metal, I have seen other kinds of bands also being labeled as heavy metal. 
our law, our, our, across the years. And I can tell you that some of those bands are not very metal, right? <laughs> I have seen bands such as Poison, which is an 80s band, hair metal band, uh, they used to call it, Bon Jovi also being characterized or categorized as heavy metal. And they are not heavy metal. I mean, they can be, you know, melodic rock or hard rock, but they are such a not heavy metal, right? So the way to think about this source is that if most of the bands that are counted in the data set are similar to Judas Priest, they are, they are, then they are counting heavy metal. But if they are also including the poisons or the Bon Jovis of the world, they are not counting just heavy metal. They are counting heavy metal plus other bands that are not really heavy metal. Well, I took the time, a couple of minutes, to go to the source and start searching for all these bands, all those bands, to see whether they are there. I look for Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi is not there. Poison is not there. I also look for other bands from the 80s that I have also seen labeled as heavy metal, such as Foreigner. The older people in the room probably remember Foreigner. I remember Foreigner has been categorized as heavy metal. Foreigner is not heavy metal. Asia from the 80s, that's not heavy metal either. Right? So I searched for Journey. Remember Journey? Journey is not heavy metal. So I searched for all these bands, and they are not there. Right? I actually took a look at the list of bands that are listed in the, in the data source, and all of them look very metal to me. So. I cannot tell whether the source is 100% right. Because in order to do that, I would need to know those all of those 100 metal bands in order to assess whether they are heavy metal or not. But at least I have taken a couple of minutes to basically verify at a very basic level that these people are counting the right thing. Now I can retweet the map. It's just two minutes. Just go to the source, take a look at it, then you can retweet it. If you don't do this operation, if you just retweet mindlessly things that you like, you may be spreading misinformation, right? And you are contributing to an environment of misinformation by spreading all over your friends and your networks a bad map. But if you assess the data first, you may not get it completely right, but at least you may get it more right than, than not, right? Now, let me show you another example that is a little bit more serious. Uh, this is a story, the following is a story that was published by Vox.com, which is a, an organization that I kind of like. I have friends who work there. But as any other journalist, they sometimes get stories that are a little bit shaky or a little bit dubious, right? At least in my opinion. Let me show you just one of them. They actually use one of those headlines that I don't like. So uh, the headline says, America's healthcare prices are out of control. These 11 charts prove it. Charts never prove anything, that's the first thing. Charts alone never prove anything, that's the first point. But also the story looked a little bit dubious to me when I, the first time that I saw it. Um, first of all, the reason why something, some sort of alarm rang in my brain is that the data looked sort of strange to me. And then, let me explain you why. So the story was made with 11 charts. This is just one of them. This shows you a comparison of the cost of a cataract surgery in different countries. You have the United States, you have Switzerland, the United, the United Kingdom, and then you have Spain, my country of origin. As you can see, the price of a cataract surgery in the US is double of what it is in Spain. Now, let me tell you why I, I, I felt that there, there was something strange about this data. And the reason why I went to the primary source in order to assess the data is that my entire family works in healthcare. My dad is a doctor, my mom is a nurse. I am the only journalist in the the only journalist in the family. Everybody else works in healthcare. And I remember the salaries that my family makes. And I remember, for example, that uh, if my dad, my dad is a cardiologist, or sorry, um, an hematologist, um, uh, if he had moved to the United States, his salary would probably be double or even triple of what it is in Spain, right? So I said, well, are these prices adjusted by purchasing power parity, which is a measure that you can take to assess, because $1,000 buy you a lot of stuff in Spain, but $1,000 in the US, I mean, it's good money, but it's not that as much money as it is in Spain, right? So that's the first reason I started wondering whether this story was right or wrong, all right? Actually, if you take a look at, for example, the disposable income of families in different countries, right? The disposable income, which is the income that you have after you pay for mandatory expenses, the disposable income of an average family in Spain is almost half of what it is in the United States. So there's a sort of a relationship between disposable income and prices uh, in all these charts. I cannot claim that the story is wrong because of this, though, okay? This is the only reason why I started looking into this story a little bit more and went to the primary source. All right. Um, by the way, let me tell you something else. This is the kind of a story that I will retweet mindlessly. 
because I am convinced right, that prices in, of healthcare in the United States are absolutely crazy. I am from Europe, I'm from Spain, and costs there are much lower than, than they are over here. But I try not to retweet things mindlessly. Right? I try to, even if they are from sources that sort of I agree with, it is better to take a look at the primary source. Right? Now, if you do this with this particular story, you will understand why I believe that the story perhaps should not have been published in its current format, or at least it would require much more reporting than it did. You cannot just take the data from the source and apply it directly. The source of the, the, source of the data for this story is an organization called the International Federation of Health Plans, which is an organization that collects all these prices from healthcare organizations, healthcare providers from all over the world. Okay? This is the page of the document the data comes from. It's the methodology page, which is really short, and anybody can understand it. You don't need advanced knowledge of statistics to read this page. Now, the first red flag, but this is not the reason why I believe that the data should not have been used. The first red flag is that the sample that was used to calculate the prices of all these procedures is not randomly selected, was not randomly selected. It was self-selected. As you can read over there, the prices for all these countries were submitted by participating federation member plans. This means that these people were not randomly selected. They just got prices from organizations that are part of this federation. Now, how were prices for all these procedures, cataract surgery and all the others, calculated? For the United States, they were calculated based on a huge database with hundreds of thousands of records. So they got 370 million medical claims and over 170 million pharmacy claims. They averaged all those prices and they came up with the average price of a cataract surgery, the average price of one night in a, in a hospital, the average price of so on and so forth, right? So they average all those millions of claims to come up with a summary statistic, the average of those prices. This is for the United States. But what about the other countries? All right? How they, did they calculate the prices for all the countries? Here comes the worrying part. They say prices for other countries are from the private sector with data provided by one private health plan in each country. Why is this problematic? And how can you explain to friends and family why this is problematic? Whenever you want to report an average, all right, you want to be able to calculate that average. If you have millions of claims, some of those claims will be more expensive than the average, some of those claims will be less expensive than the average. If you have hundreds of millions of claims, if you average them all, probably the average that you will get will be close to the actual average. Okay? The bigger the sample, the more likely it will be that the actual estimate, the point estimate, will be close to the average. But if you only use a sample size of one, if you only take one, one provider, it may be that that provider is close to the average in terms of prices, but it could be much more expensive than the average of the country. It could be less expensive than the average of the country. I tend to do these kinds of infographics all the time when I explain these very basic concepts to people. It could be over here or it could be over here. We don't know whether that single provider from Spain is representative of the average prices in Spain. We don't know it, right? We don't know it. It could be, but it could not be, right? Now, the source itself, to add insult to injury, the source itself sort of tells you at the very end of the methodology page, please don't use this data. Because at the end, at the end of the methodology page, it says comparisons across different countries are complicated. Well, of course they are complicated by differences in sectors and so on and so forth. Single plans prices may not be representative of prices paid paid by other plans in that market. Well, obviously, right? This, they may not be representative. Therefore, you cannot use the data directly. You need more research. You need more information. You need to compare this source to other sources rather than downloading the data and plotting it in graphs and then claiming that prices in the United States are crazy. I do believe that they are crazy, but you need more research if you want to actually uh, support that assessment, right? This kind of operation, this kind of very quick assessment of the quality of the data, I believe that can be learned and can be taught to anybody. Because again, you don't need uh, advanced knowledge of numbers in order to read all that, right? And to understand why these may be problematic in some cases. Second principle, this is a very important one. As I mentioned before, charts, maps, visualizations, they can be extremely persuasive. And we also tend to read too much into them when we see them. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of what I mean. The first example comes from a wonderful book that I recommend to everybody called Teaching Statistics, A Bag of Tricks by Professors Andrew Gelman and Deborah Nolan, two statisticians. In that book, 
uh, 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 Gelman and Nolan show this map over here. This map over here shows you the counties in the United States with the lowest kidney cancer death rates in that decade, right? So you have those counties plotted, the ones that are highlighted on the map, those are the ones that have the lowest rates of death of cancer, right? Now, you see that map, and I can assure you that a normal human brain will start looking for possible explanations as to why these are the counties that have the lowest mortality rates. There's another piece of information that is quite important over here, which is that most of these counties are rural counties. They are not urban counties. They are rural counties. And I can assure you that a normal human brain, once that brain knows those pieces of information, low cancer mortality rates, most of them are rural, you will start making connections here. Right? You will start, for example, I'm going to verbalize what a normal human brain will do. All right, so Okay, so all these counties, they have very low mortality rates because of cancer. And all right, so and, and most of them are rural. Uh, why could this be? Well, it could be because people in rural counties exercise more. They walk more, right? It could be. And we know that, you know, higher rates of exercise are connected to lower rates of cancer, right? Um, it could be perhaps because people in rural counties eat better. Perhaps they eat organic. They grow their own food in the backyard. I don't know. And we know that eating better is also connected to lower rates of cancer. So it could be that, right? Or, or, or it could be that, you know, in rural counties, people to ha tend to have stronger connections to their families and friends, etc. And we know that having social, strong social networks in which you talk to people in person all the time is also sort of related to high, r more rapid recovery from diseases, right? So it could be any of these, right? That all these that I'm doing, all those stories, are here. They are created here. They are not on the map. The map is only showing you the lowest rates of cancer. And moreover, this is only showing you the lowest rates of cancer. Let's take a look at the highest rates of cancer, eh? the mortality because of cancer in the United States. They all happen in rural counties. Now, why? This is a very simple thing that you can explain to anybody with a very simple infographic. These are all rural counties that are sparsely populated, right? So imagine a county in which you only have a population of 10, right? And then in one decade, in one decade, one person dies of kidney cancer. Suddenly, you have a rate of 10%, which is a huge rate right, of death of cancer, all right? So that county will end up on that map over there, the highest rate. And then on the, on the decade after that, in that county with only 10 inhabitants, all right, nobody dies because of cancer. Therefore, you have a rate of 0%, a very low rate. Therefore, it end, ends up over here. This is a basic, a basic feature of statistics and sampling, which is that big populations or big samples tend to vary much less than smaller samples or small populations. Small populations tend to vary much more. We are seeing this effect over here. So no organic food, no more exercise, no more stronger connections, networks, etc. It's just an effect of the numbers themselves. Now let me show you another example of, of graphic that sometimes people have used to infer more than they should have. Um, during the debate about Obamacare, I saw uh, liberal pundits are using the following chart to defend the idea that Obamacare is great for the job market. And I don't have an opinion about that. I'm not an economist. I'm not a statistician. I'm just a journalist, so I cannot talk about as to whether Obamacare is good for the economy or bad for the economy. What I do know, though, is that the graphics that these pundits were using, uh, you cannot infer that Obamacare is good for the job market using that graphic alone. Right? They were saying, well, if you take a look at the number of people in the workforce, the, that's the y-axis, that line over there, uh, month by month, so the x-axis is, is, is month of the year, you can see the economic crisis there, and then suddenly you see the economic recovery right after. And notice what happens when the curve changes. Obamacare was passed, so Obamacare is great for the job market, right? Wrong. The chart is just showing you two phenomena that may be connected or may not be connected. You don't know. The chart doesn't tell you that. The chart is just showing you two separate phenomena that for some reason happen to coincide in time. But you cannot infer that one of those phenomena lead to the other phenomena, right? Obamacare gets passed, and then the, uh, the, the job market recovers, right? It could, you, could, you could find many other possible explanations as to why that change of direction happened. And again, I'm, not ex I'm no expert by any means, but I do know that, for example, President Obama recovery package was passed around here. Billions of dollars got injected in the job market. 
uh, to companies. And it may happen, again, this is just conjecture, right? I have not tested any of these things, but it could happen that the money that got injected over here started kicking in over here, and then companies started hiring more people. Moreover, you could think about counterfactuals. You could say, well, what about if Obamacare got killed in Congress, for example, or was never passed because the courts uh, had killed it or something? It could be that that recovery that we see over there could be steeper without Obamacare, or it could be less steep without Obamacare. Therefore, Obamacare will be good for the market, right? Now, the problem is that when we see a chart, we see what it shows. And we tend to see more than what it shows. And when we should never do that. We should put ourselves in control and see only what the chart is showing and not inferring, for example, in this case, a causal connection between two different phenomena. It happens to all of us. It has happened to all of us. It has happened to me. But there is one way to curb that tendency of our brain to see these kinds of causal connections, which is to be aware and to tell yourself, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute, what is going on over here? And thinking about alternative scenarios and then looking for more information or consult with experts, right? So I could consult, for example, with economists, statisticians, etc. Okay. Now, the other, another point is, is the data represented accurately? Remember that the whole idea of data visualization is the idea of visual encoding, proportionally representing the numbers by the variation of length, height, position, color, size, and so on and so forth. Sometimes that principle is not that well respected. Let me show you a couple of examples. Uh, this graphic over here was shown by Venezolana de Televisión. Venezolana de Televisión is a TV station in Venezuela. Uh, that reported the results of the latest presidential elections in Venezuela a few years ago. Uh, there were two candidates in those elections, Nicolas Maduro, which, who is the president right now of Venezuela, and then you have Enrique Capriles, who is the candidate of the opposition party. And then you have the percentages of vote of each one of those candidates, and as you can notice, thanks to the bars, all right, uh, the size of those bars, Nicolas Maduro got around, I don't know, 10 times the vote as Enrique Caprilli, so he probably won on a landslide, right? Be just because the size of the bar is 10 times, the, the size of the red bar is 10 times the height of the, of the blue bar. But the numbers that are representing on the graphic are slightly different than that. <laughs> and the differences between the two candidates are actually much smaller, right? Now, I, I, when I teach visualization, I usually tell my students, and in my books I also write about that, that there are few, very, very few rules rules, actual rules in data visualization. There are many guidelines and there are many rules of thumb and so on and so forth, but there are very few rules that are set in stone. One of them, one of those very few rules is that graphics that use height or length as method of encoding need to begin at zero. Because if they don't begin at zero, if you truncate the axis of those graphics, then the size of those bars that you're using to represent the data will not be proportional to the data that they are representing. So this is wrong, truncating the y-axis of a bar graph that is better, not truncating the axis of a bar graph. The rule, this rule, by the way, doesn't apply to other kinds of graphs. It only applies to graphs that are based on length and height to represent the data. Now, scales, playing with the scales is one of the ways that charts can end up lying uh, more often. Right? Let me show you a graphic that was used in Congress a while ago to attack a Planned Parenthood. Uh, so as you know, Planned Parenthood is being attacked by conservatives. Liberals tend to support Planned Parenthood. <laughs> It doesn't really matter what you think about Planned Parenthood. That's completely bes besides the point. All right? I have my own opinions about Planned Parenthood. Probably you have your own opinions about Planned Parenthood. All right? But this talk is just about graphics. It's just about charts. And if you want to attack Planned Parenthood, you better use good graphics. But unfortunately, conservatives, when attacking Planned Parenthood and trying to, they try to kill um, a, a funding for Planned Parenthood, they were using charts like this one. This chart over here was shown by, I believe, Representative Jason Schaefes from, from Utah. Um, I believe that he's from Utah. And it's showing, basically, the number of abortions done by Planned Parenthood between two years and the number of cancer screening procedures and prevention services by Planned Parenthood over those two years as well. And as you can see, it's a perfect X shape, right? So they, sh they change at the same rate, basically, one going up and another one going down. Obviously, when this graph is presented to you at a certain distance, what your eyes fix on is the shape, right? The, 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 the rate of, sh of change of those two numbers. It is actually quite hard to read the numbers themselves. But if you actually can read them, you will see that 
This change over, here, change over here goes from 2 million procedures down to 1 million procedures. So that's a quite a steep drop. But this number over here goes from 300,000 up to 320,000. So it's not the same rate of change, right? So if you want to use these to make your case against Planned Parenthood, you should put the two numbers on the same scale, right? <laughs> the problem is then that the data may not support your opinion, right? Moreover, moreover, this graphic is problematic for many other reasons, which is that Planned Parenthood does many other things other than abortions and cancer screening. They also do uh, STD testing and many other kinds of things. So designer Emily Such, who uh, downloaded the data of all procedures that Planned Parenthood does, created the following graph in which she showed everything that Planned Parenthood does. That's a much better chart than this one. Regardless of what your ideological position is, objectively speaking, that's a much better chart than this one. Because this one is misrepresenting the data by playing with a dual scale. Right? The dual scales are usually problematic. That's why I mentioned that quote up there from a wonderful book called Standard Deviations, double the access, double the mischief. Right? So when you manipulate a dual scale chart, uh, you may end up telling the story that you want to tell rather than the story that you should tell, right? which is the story that is told by that other graphic over there, which is much more complete and much better at representing the data proportionally, the change uh, in, in, in procedures that uh, Planned Parenthood conducts every year. Now, let me show you another graphic that misleads a lot of people, a lot of people. This is a map that hangs on the walls of the White House at the moment. This is a photograph that was taken by a reporter in the White House right after the 2016 presidential election. This is called, by the way, in the jargon of my field, a choropleth map. A choropleth map is a map that represents data using shade of color. In this case, is how many votes the Republican Party got, a percentage, actually, the percentage of votes of the Republican Party, the percentage of vote of the Democratic candidate, right? And then uh, county by county, the shade of color represents the intensity, the number of votes over there, the percentage of votes, right? Now, President Trump is very font of this map and for a while uh, he printed out copies of this map and he handed out copies of this map to reporters that came visit him in the Oval Office. He's obviously very proud of his victory. He should be. He won against all odds, right? And, and um, this, is a, this is Photoshop, but it's quite representative of what was happening. So reporters were coming into the Oval Office and President Trump was giving them copies of the map uh, and showing them the map. There's a report from Reuters that describes this. Show the map saying, see? See the map? This is red. This is us. This is us, right? Now, I like to offer my free advice to anybody who wants to take it. And what I would tell President Trump is that he's been misled very badly by this map. Not only President Trump, by the way, right? Media, who su media that supports President Trump like the, likes this map very much. So for example, places like Infowars and Breitbart and organizations like this love this map and tend to use it uh, all the time. Um, uh, even books, the map has appeared also in the cover of books, such as, for example, this one written by author uh, Jack Posobiec. Uh, it's called, it's titled Citizens for Trump. And again, I, as I like to offer my free advice to whoever wants to take it, when I saw this map, this, this cover, this book cover on social media, I tweeted at Posobiec saying, you know, I believe that uh, you need to either change the title of the book or change the map. Right? And I'm, I'm, I know that, that the changing a map may be difficult because you need to know how to design a map and you need to use a specialized software to design that map. So perhaps it's a little bit easier to change the title of the book to something that is actually more representative of what the map is actually showing, counties for Trump. Because the map is not showing you citizens, it is showing you territory, the amount of land that was won by each one of the candidates. Remember the whole idea behind data visualization. Data visualization is the representation, the proportional representation of numbers through sizes, colors, etc., etc. If you remember that, right, the popular vote split in this country was almost 50-50. It was 48%, 46%. But the amount of red and the amount of blue on this map is likely 90% red and 10% blue because it is showing territory, right? And uh, counties that tend to vote Republican tend to, be, tend to be rural, bigger, and more sparsely populated. And counties that vote more Democratic, uh, population density tends to be much higher, right? And that is not reflected on the map, right? Conservatives love this map, right? Conservatives love this map. And I have seen it used over and over and over in social media. Liberals, on the other hand, 
love this other map over here. Now, this map over here is called a proportional symbol map. A proportional symbol map uses a symbol, usually a bubble, right, of different sizes to represent some sort of number, right? For example, here we are color coding each one of the counties according to who won on each one of the counties, but then we size the bubble according to either population or number of voters, all right? So if you want to represent the number of people who voted for each count for each candidate, perhaps the second map is a little bit better because the amount of blue is more or less equal in terms of area, total area of blue, is more or less equal to the amount of red on the map, right? 46, 48 percent, perhaps it's a better representation of the uh, a, of what happened, right? But I would say, I mean, I follow both conservatives and, and liberals in social media, and I would contend that neither of them is right in this particular case, because in a presidential election, and I have seen this debate all the time, this map is crap, let's use that one, then goes up, that map is crap, let's use this one. None of those maps is, I mean, both of them are correct in the sense of mathematical representation of the data. There is nothing wrong with them, but they are representing the wrong metric because what really matters in a presidential election to win an election is neither the amount of counties that you win nor the amount of people who vote for you. What really matters is the amount of electoral votes that you win. So if you want to represent what happened in the elections, in the 2016 elections, perhaps you can do a simple pie chart like this one over here that shows you the number of electoral votes votes won by President Trump and the number of electoral votes won by candidate Clinton. And perhaps you compare that chart with any of those maps, but also with this other map over here called a cartogram. A cartogram is a map in which the scales of the different areas are sized according to some sort of metric. In this case, is the number of electoral votes for uh, that, that come from each one of these, of these states. None of these maps is wrong per se. What is wrong is our interpretation of these maps, what we extract from them and what we see on them. And also what is wrong is the metric that is being used. Because again, a popular vote doesn't matter that much. Amount of territory, it doesn't matter that much. What matters is that, the number of electoral votes. This leads me to the next point. Is the graphic showing an appropriate amount of data? This is a very, very critical thing to always ask ourselves whenever we see a chart or a graph or a map in the, in the media, right? So for example, in a story like this, going back to this one, if you want to actually show people what actually happened in the presidential elections, you may need all those maps together, right? All those factors are important to report about the story. Some of them are more important than others. So perhaps you should first show first that, and then show that, and then show that. So there's a hierarchy of importance. But the three of them let you see what happened in the election from a, multi, for a diff, from a different angle, right? Now, let me show you another example of what I mean by showing an appropriate amount of data. Now, the reason why I, I tend to highlight this principle is that in the world that I, where I come from, the world of journalism, journalists tend to like to simplify. I have, I have heard the verb to simplify, let's simplify this, this is too complicated, let's simplify it. I tend to use that, I tend to hear that all the time. And the verb to simplify or the word simplification can be a little bit tricky because sometimes when we only think about simplification, we may end up oversimplifying the story that we are trying to present. So I tend to prefer to talk about clarification. We need to clarify stories. Now, in order to clarify, sometimes you need to reduce the amount of data that you show because you don't want to overwhelm people with data that is completely useless, right? So you need to reduce. But sometimes you need to increase the amount of data that you show in order to provide a truthful story or a truthful uh, representation of what the data represents. Let me show you just a couple of examples. The first one is not a graphic. It's just a story that includes a few numbers. But I believe that those numbers are not well handled. So a while ago, Breitbart.com published the following headline. 2,139 DACA recipients convicted or accused of crimes against Americans. So this story was saying that uh, more than 2,000 people who are protected under the uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, you know about this plan probably, um, lost their protections because they were convicted of a crime or accused or accused of a crime, right? And Breitbart was saying that this is a staggering number. There's a big number, right? It's 2,000 people. And it's 
personally sounds like a big number. It's tons of people. It's more than 2,000 of these people who lost their protections because of being criminals, right? Remember that DACA is basically protects a program that protects uh, undocumented immigrants who arrived to the United States when there were minors, right? Now, now they could be up to 32 years old or something like that, but they arrived to the country when they were minors, brought by their parents or other family members, right? Now, when I saw this story, I, I, I said, well, the number looks big, right? But is it really big, right? Is this putting this number in context? are these people putting this number in context, right? They are just providing one number, right? That, and that number sounds very big, 2,000 people, but a number on its own never means anything or nothing unless that you compare it to something else, right? In this case, we could compare, for example, the number of people who lost their DACA protections versus the number of people who are protected by the DACA program, for instance, right? That would be the denominator of a, of a division, right? That number is 800,000 people. So it's 2,000 people and something out of 800,000, right? Now, I'm not very good at mental math, and I have some problems wrapping my head around around 2,000 here, 800,000 over here. I prefer to represent and things graphically, right? And simply so people can understand it. So 2,139 DACA recipients out of 800,000 is more or less three people out of 1,000. That's more or less when you make the division. It's actually a little bit lower. It's two point something, right? Um, actually, the percentage is 0.27%, but that's a difficult number to rub your head around. 0.27%, what does that mean, right? It is much easier to visualize a number like that. So it's like less than three DACA recipients lost their DACA protections because they were accused or convicted of a crime out of 1,000, three of out of 1,000, right? Now, this is one way in which we can put the number in context. Now, the number doesn't look that big as it did before. It looked very big before, but now it looks really small, right? It looks super, super small. Now, it would look even smaller if we compare this to, I don't know, what is the rate of Americans, all right, citizens, Americans, who are actually convicted of a crime, ex-felons, for example, right? And I'm going to show you that number, but I'm going to make a caveat before I show that. These comparisons can be a little bit tricky. So when you have access to all these slides, there is a link on the following slide that leads you to an article that I wrote explaining all the complications with these kinds of comparisons. But in any case, the rate of people in the United States who are ex-felons is 64 out of 1,000. Now, this comparison is quite complicated because over here we have, for example, people who are 30, under 32 years old, and here we are, we are comparing that number to Americans of all, of all ages. So in order to make a, a fair comparison, we will need to get that rate for Americans who are under 32 years old as well, so for the comparison to be better. But the number, right now, we are at least comparing that number that we had before with another number that puts that other number in context, and then now the number looks even smaller. So I would claim that the number reported by Breitbart is actually not staggeringly high, now it looks staggeringly low. It means that DACA recipients are actually less dangerous than citizens, right? Now, let me show you another example. Um, this uh, was shown on Twitter a while ago. This shows the unemployment rate under each one of these presidents as after 100 days in office, right? So it looks perfectly fine, super clear, and super easy to understand. It's a simplification, right? Simplification of data. You can understand it like that, right? So under President Obama, and in his first three months in office on average, the unemployment rate was 9 percent, under President Bush it was 4.4 percent, and under President Clinton it was 7.1 percent, right? Now, objectively, it doesn't really matter what you think about this news organization, it doesn't really matter what you think about each one of these presidencies, but objectively this is an oversimplification. Because if you think critically about these numbers, all right, the unemployment rate in the first three months of any presidency is largely what you inherited from the previous guy, right? So this rate is what Obama inherited from Bush, that rate is what Bush inherited from Clinton, and so on and so forth. So in order to present a more accurate representation of the data, and again, this is independent of ideology, of ideology if you want to present a more accurate rep a, a picture of the data, you need to increase the amount of data that you show. You could, for example, I don't know, just a very, a very simple example, you could compare the unemployment rate on the first day of each presidency and the unemployment rate on the last month or the last day of each one of these presidencies. Then the story will be a little bit more accurate, right? So we have Clinton first day, Clinton last day, Bush first day, Bush, la Bush last day, and so on and so forth. And then you can show the percent a point, the percentage point variation under each one of those presidencies. That is a much more truthful representation of the data 
than these, if you want to tell the truth, which I believe that all of us should want to tell the truth, or at least we should demand not be lied at, all right, by the graphics that are being presented to us. This graphic lies because it's an oversimplification of the data. That one is a little bit better because it shows us the compare to what factor, compare to what, compare to the beginning, compare to the end. Now, let me show you another example of graphic that misleads, I believe, a lot of people, even if the graphic is perfectly fine. The graphic is perfectly fine, mathematically speaking. Now, this is the murder rate in the United States, okay? The murder rate in the United States. So, the story of the murder rate and violent crime in general in the United States, it, it, the story is the following. In the 80s, 17 and 80s, the murder rate and violent crime in general went up very rapidly. Then there was a drop in the murder rate in the 90s then the murder rate stayed more or, less, more or less the same during the 2000s. And then in the past two or three years, the murder rate in the country has started growing again, spiking up uh, in the past two or three years. If you extend this chart up to 2016, the line will continue going up, right? Now, this, this graphic is perfectly fine. This is based on sound data provided by probably by the F FBI, by police uh, offices all over the country. So it's perfectly fine, right? But it's also quite misleading. Why? Because it's a simplification, right? It's so showing you the murder rate all over the United States. It's getting the entire population of the United States, the number of murders, and then it's calculating the number of murders per 100,000 people. And the problem, this is sort of an average, right? It's not the mean or the median, but we could call it an average. On average, this is the murder rate all over the country. And the problem is that these kinds of rates can be largely affected by outliers. And let me tell you what, why, what the outliers are here. Now, I didn't do this exercise, but based on things that I have read, most cities and most neighborhoods in the United States, in all cities of the United States, the murder rate is actually quite low. Right? So visualize, for example, tons of dots down there. Right? Imagine that you have there thousands and th thousands of little dots, each one of them representing the number of murders or the murder rate on all neighborhoods all over the United States. Okay? This is completely fictional, but imagine that a little, ton of little dots over there. I'm pretty sure that most neighborhoods in the United States are down there on the scale. The problem is, with the murder rate, that there are certain neighborhoods in certain cities, such as Chicago, Milwaukee, Miami, Baltimore, D.C., etc., that are so dangerous and so, so violent and so many people die that if you try to plot them in this chart, they will go through the roof. They are so high up on the scale, all right, those, we call those outliers, that they work like a, they work like a magnet, right? You have those uh, neighborhoods up here on the scale, all right? If you take them away, probably the murder rate will stay the same. I have not tested that, but that's my guess, that's my conjecture. But once you put them over here, they attract the line up. They bring that sort of average up over here. So whenever we see stories like these, um, uh, represented or shown in the media, we need to demand from journalists that they take these kinds of caveats into account. They should never show just this graphic, they should also discuss the outliers that may be distorting the data that is being presented. Okay, here I have posted, I put a story in the New York Times that discusses all these problems with the data about the, about the murder rate, okay? All those outliers. And then finally, Another thing that we need to consider is to whether the uncertainty of the data is being considered for the story and is being shown in that story. Let me show you an example. Probably most of you have heard about what's happening right now in the region of Catalonia in Spain. Catalonia is a region in Spain in which a substantial part of the population wants Catalonia to become an independent country. Another portion of the population wants Catalonia to be part of Spain and remain part of Spain. Well, the Catalonian government, the regional government of Catalonia, has been conducting a survey every year for the past decade or so, asking Catalonian tons of questions. And among them, one of them is, do you want Catalonia to be an independent country, a country or do you want Catalonia to be a region of Spain, right? And they have gathered those data, those data are available and you can download them. A while ago, El País, which is the most important newspaper in Spain, the most widely read uh, newspaper in Spain, published the following story. This was published in 2013 or 2014. Catalan public opinion swings toward no for independence, says survey. The, the title, the headline in, in Spanish was much more straightforward and clear cut. It was the no to independence is bigger than the yes 
to independence in the survey, right? Now, is that right or is that wrong? Let's take a look at the story. So the story begins by saying, a majority in the region of Catalonia would reject secession if a referendum were held now. And the story contained a graph, right? Imagine a bar graph, in which you represent the data, right? You have no to independence, 45.3%, yes to independence, 44.5%, right? And it's bigger, the no is bigger than the yes. This is the no and this is the yes. And as you can see, the no is slightly bigger than the yes. Now, but this is the, sto is the story true or not? If you keep reading the story, the reporter himself, the reporter of the story, in one of the paragraphs of the story, says, or wrote, and I quote, the margin of error of the poll is three points, a relevant fact considering the tight difference between the yes and the no to independence in Catalonia. Well, of course that is relevant. It is so relevant, in fact, that based on the data, if you don't consider just this data, but also this data over here, you cannot claim that the no is bigger than the yes or that the yes is bigger than the no. Because the margin of error is so wide in comparison to the difference between those two numbers that it could be perfectly well that the yes is bigger than the no, or the no is bigger than the yes. All that you can say in a title is that the no and the yes seem to be tied. That's all that you can say, nothing else. You cannot claim that one of them is bigger than the other. So, one thing that we need to grow used to whenever we see graphics that look clear cut and very sharp and in, in terms of the edges of those charts, we need to educate ourselves and help other people educate themselves as to whenever they see a graphic that looks so sharp and accurate and precise as that, we need to visualize a gradient representing the level of uncertainty around that point estimate. We need to do this mentally. Sometimes we can do it graphically, right? I believe that that would be a, perhaps a better representation to show the fuzziness of the data. But if it is not represented graphically, we can still force ourselves to visualize that cloud of uncertainty around that point estimate. So those are the principles that I would like you to keep in mind. Uh, in the future, whenever you see a graph or a chart and share them, if you want, with friends and family. But there's one last point, just very quick. This is all related to uh, what we could call uh, a revolution in critical thinking or in visual literacy, graphicacy, etc. I believe that a revolution in critical thinking would lead us nowhere if it is not paired with a revolution in ethical thinking or moral reasoning, what it is that we publish and what it is that we spread in social media, for example. That is part of moral thinking, right? Now, and let me, say, let me explain to you why I believe that this is so important. Data visualization is a tool. It's a tool for understanding. It's a conceptual tool that, or a visual tool that helps us extract meaning from data. It's a very powerful tool. We human beings are a species that develop tools to extend our own body, all right, to make us stronger, to make us smarter, and so on and so forth. For me, data visualization can be conceptualized as a tool. The same way that statistics is a tool or the scientific method is a tool. The scientific method is a tool that helps us guide our intuitions to the right place, right? but it's a conceptual tool, right? Now, tools can be conceptual or they can be physical, but in terms of how we think about them, they're pretty similar. For me, data visualization could be, uh, we could make an analogy with a hammer. It's not that different than a hammer. Data visualization is something that make us, can make us potentially, we can make, it can make us smarter, the same way that a hammer can make us stronger. It makes us stronger when we hit something. Any tool, regardless of whether it is physical or mental conceptual can be used to build. The same way that a hammer can be used to build houses, for example, data visualization can be used to, to build understanding, right? But the same tool, the hammer, can be used to destroy those same houses. The same way that visualization, the same exact same tool, can be used to destroy understanding. So it is up to us to decide how we are going to use it. Therefore, in order to use data visualization more critically and more ethically in the future, in your own lives, first of all, we need to try to put our own biases under control a little bit, right? Whenever we see a story, a graphic in the media that confirms what we already believe, perhaps we should not retweet it immediately. It would be better to read it carefully, take a look at the primary source, etc. And then, you, once you have assessed the quality of that graphic, then you can retweet it, right? But first of all, try to put your own ideological bias is under control, regardless of whether you are conservative or liberal. It doesn't really matter. And your own cognitive biases, by the way. In the link that I will provide to you, there are there's a list of readings, including several books that talk about cognitive biases, such as the confirmation bias, and so on and so forth.
Also remembering that in any argument that you have with anybody who has ideological positions that are opposite to yours, being truthful and being honest matters that more, much more than winning an argument. Now, I tend to be very argumentative on social media, and I know how great it feels to crush someone in an argument. I say, I want this argument, right? It feels so great emotionally, right? But we need to curb that. We need to basically force ourselves to try to use only honest arguments and good graphics, good visualizations, and good data whenever we argue with someone. And also, as I mentioned before, I already anticipated this, not retweet things immediately, not sharing social uh, things on social media without assessing whether that thing looks good or it looks dubious, because otherwise we are in danger of spreading misinformation. Even if that misinfor misinformation confirms our own positions or our own ideas, it's not a good contribution to a healthy media environment or media landscape or informational landscape. And finally, if you are convinced of all these ideas and the one that I presented before, I would ask you, please, help me spread these ideas in the future. Again, remember that all of you will have access to all these slides. Feel free to use them, expand on them, or correct them. If you saw something that you don't agree with, feel free to repurpose them for your own classes, for your own, to share with your own friends, family, etc. And thank you so much again for having me. It has been an honor. Do we have five time for five minutes for questions? Time. Five? We have time yeah. for a couple of questions. Couple of questions? Yeah. Okay. And if you haven't yet, you can write your email on the laptop back here and I will send you the link and the Dropbox folder and everything later this afternoon. Yeah, this afternoon. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. So there's kind of a, a real oh, recording it, so we can just ask. Uh, so there's sort of a genre of, of uh, a kind of talk where a professional, could be a scientist, a mathematician, finds that uh, there needs to be a new kind of literacy. Right? Yes. I've lived through scientific literacy, the push for scientific literacy, math literacy, computer literacy, statistical literacy, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and they all seem to have the same uh, form in some respects. They start out, uh, they talk about a new technique which we're using. Uh, they show popular ignorance concerning something, and then they sort of say how people should think. Uh -huh. But in this particular case, one problem is that a lot of what you're, you're asking in these suggestions is for people to slow down. Yes. This seems a problem of speed. Mm -hmm. But unlike the neutrality of a hammer, there's something in infographics which is contributing to speed. It's mm, consumed. Okay. So I wonder how, how in an media environment in which graphics are embraced precisely because they promote speed yeah. mm -hmm. and you want them to somehow get people to stop and slow down, how, how do you imagine that happening? Well, I imagine it happening, well, as I said before, by controlling ourselves. And graphics, by the way, are not that different to headlines. There has been, uh, has been shown that people tend to share stories in social media only after reading the headline alone. They don't read the story. So it's an equivalent problem. It's not a problem only with graphics. It's not that the graphic itself prompts you to share it very quickly. It's also the headline. So the same technique that you can use not to spread a bad story based on the headline alone can be used to avoid spreading a, a bad graphics, which is to slow yourself, as you said. It's like we need to educate ourselves Right? Because I, I'm, 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 I'm to blame in, in all these. I have shared stories in social media that I should have not shared without verifying, it, verifying them very quickly. And I have learned to curb that impulse a little bit myself. Right? I don't, I don't, I'm not successful 100% of the time. But if we are successful at curbing that impulse only 10% of the time or 20% of the time, that is progress, I believe. And I think that this principle can be taught. Um, um, is this a new kind of literacy? I don't know if it is a new literacy or not. It's all is interrelated, right? This is not just graphics, it's also numeracy, and it's also related to literacy. But that is not that important. The point is that we all today, nowadays, with the tools that we have at our disposal to spread information through social media, etc., we are all sort of responsible to, uh, as to what we put out or what we spread in media. Thank you. Um, is there a way to identify differences between willfully misleading uh, readers of you know whatever media outlet is putting forward, uh -huh. uh, bunk, 
uh, data visualizations yeah. and sort of like in the Vox example, that seemed more like an oversight Mistake, than an, oversight. an intentional mm -hmm. misleading. And it seems as though depending on um, what we determine the ultimate cause of that oversight to yeah. be, the way we respond to it maybe should be different depending on how egregious it is. Yeah. What well, about that difference? Look, I don't know. I don't know whether it is possible or not to identify whether someone is uh, willingly lying to you or they, they just make a mis made a mistake. More often than not, uh, I tend to believe that people in general have good intentions. With the exception of some people who are ex extremely ideologically oriented on both the left and the right, most people who work in media try to be honest. We all make mistakes. I have made tons of mistakes in the past, right? And I acknowledge them, and many of them are reflected in this talk. Like, for example, not showing the uncertainty. I have done that myself, right? And I, now I, I know a little bit better. Um, uh, but as you said, I mean, uh, sometimes in the Vox.com uh, Vox story, for example, I don't think that they were trying to lie. It's just that probably they were producing that story very quickly. They downloaded the data. That, and it becomes an important point. Vox.com has a liberal orientation. So they saw those numbers and said, oh, this is so crazy, right? So you have a connection between your ideological orientation and what the data is showing, and then you don't feel that prompted to verify your own ideas or to ver your, verify your own data. That is when your, your, your system two, cognitive system, should come in and say, wait a minute, let's verify this with other sources if you have time, right? But I don't think that it makes a huge difference whether someone is trying to lie to you willingly or whether that is just the product of an oversight. The result is the same. It's a graphic that misleads you. And that is what we need to be aware of. And that's the reason why we perhaps could try to inoculate ourselves a little bit uh, towards what we see in the media every day and become a little bit more critical and skeptical. We can take just one more question. OK. All right, perfect. Everybody's okay. ready for lunch. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank you.